Here's a riddle. There's something in our town that's full of history, ecology, industry, and transportation. What is it? It's the Hudson River. Join us as we learn about the Hudson River. I'm William John. I'm Brad Butler. I'm Carlos Pat. I'm Kim Wood. I'm James Wright. I'm Alex Shapiro. I'm Carly Markarian, and this is Our Town, a program about the Hudson Valley for kids. The Hudson River is a curiosity to many. From the first people to European exploration up to the present day, many are drawn to its waters due to its majestic beauty, geographical location, and natural resources. In fact, the Hudson River is considered the true place where America won its independence from the British. While the Revolutionary War started in the state of Massachusetts, the majority of the battles were fought here in the Hudson Valley. But long before America won its independence, there were native people here who used the river in their daily lives. We learned more about these people when we visited with naturalist Tom Lake up at Bowdoin Park in Wapping Jersey Falls. It is often assumed that human presence in the Hudson Valley started with the arrival of Henry Hudson. However, there were people living here long before that. In fact, in 1609, when Henry Hudson came up the river for the first time, there were about 10,000 natives living in the valley. I'm here in Bowdoin Park with Tom Lake, a lecturer of anthropology at Dutchess Community College. Was the river an important factor in the lives of the natives? Kim, to answer that question, we have to go back before there was a Hudson River. In fact, before there were even people living in the Hudson Valley. Uh, 20,000 years ago, if we were standing here, we would have had 10,000 feet of ice over our heads, almost two miles. It wasn't though until about 12 or 13,000 years ago that the first people came to the Hudson Valley. And they were lured here by the Hudson River for various reasons. The first people to come here uh, were drawn here by the Easy Passageway. They're also drawn here by enormous numbers of migrating waterfowl, which provided uh, a ready food source. The first people here uh, were also drawn perhaps by the first migratory fish from the Hudson River, from the ocean into the Hudson River. We're at the North Bowden Rock Shelter today. And this rock shelter, the first presence of humans at this rock shelter, dates to about 7,000 years ago. So this might have been a place people would come in April and May and June. They would live here. They would take uh, daily forays a quarter of a mile down to the Hudson River, catch fish, process the fish, and bring them back up here. What did the natives think of the river? Well, the Mohican Indians who lived along the Hudson River just to the north of here uh, refer to the Hudson River as Grandmother River. Uh, and it's entirely a sense of reverence. They recognize that the Hudson River uh, sustained their life. It brought them fish, it provided um, a way for migratory waterfowl to be present. They also noticed some interesting things about the Hudson River. They had a word, at least the Mohican Indians, and I think the Lenape, who live just to the south of here, refer to the river as Mahikanituk, um, which to them is translated as the river that flows both ways. And today we recognize that that idea of the river flowing both ways is something we see in an estuary. So the river to them was a 12 month a year provider of life. What types of food did the natives get from the Hudson? Well, there were, there were many species of fish and shellfish from the Hudson River. Uh, one of the examples that we know was uh, harvested right here at Bowdoin Park were the uh, giant sturgeon that came in from the ocean. Uh, here's a, an example of one of their scales. Um, these are fish that can grow to be 12, 14 feet long and weigh five or 600 pounds, maybe even larger than that. Uh, we know that about uh, 4,000 years ago, Indians living in this park would come here in the springtime. They would get down to the river and they would use nets or they would use harpoons, which they would fashion uh, from the antlers of white-tailed deer. Makes a very nice little harpoon. And they would spear them with something like this to catch them. They would bring the sturgeon in and they would process the sturgeon, they would uh, fillet it, so to speak, um, and then they would smoke the fish. This was important because for many of the foods uh, taken, especially from the Hudson River, there was no refrigeration, they were too far from the ocean to use salt, and so to preserve the food so it would be available for a longer period of time, they would smoke the fish. And we have evidence here at Bowdoin Park of a smoking hut that was built by the Indians and used probably to smoke sturgeon. Native people were commercial fishing on the Hudson River when the Europeans arrived. 
different type of commercial fishing than we think of today, though. You might have had one village who specialized in catching shad or herring or striped bass, and perhaps they would catch fish and then trade them or barter them with another group of people who perhaps were masters at making pottery. Uh, so it was sort of a bartering system more than anything else. When the Europeans arrived, uh, they really did not have any uh, skills for commercial fishing in the Hudson. So the native people uh, took them under their wing and showed them how to commercial fish, which was critical to the survival of the first Europeans here in the Hudson Valley. What role did the beaver play in the lives of the natives? Before the arrival of the Europeans, the native people hunted and trapped beaver for its fur to make clothing out of. They ate the food, they ate the meat for food. Um, and they use parts of its bones and teeth as tools. Uh, once the Europeans uh, arrived, however, things changed. The beaver was quickly recognized as being a very valuable commodity to people in Europe. So the native people along the Hudson River abandoned many parts of their culture to focus on the capture of beaver for the Europeans. And in fact, 20 of these pelts uh, would have returned one musket from the Dutch. So you can see how important it was. By the 1640s, there were no beaver left and muskets became uh, very important to the native people at that time. Are there still native people in the Hudson Valley? Here in the Hudson Valley, we just don't have very many native people left. What happened in uh, 1609 uh, when Henry Hudson sailed up the river and in the aftermath of the Dutch coming into the Hudson Valley uh, was a tremendous clash between a Western European way of looking at things and a native way of looking at things. Between the value of the fur in the Hudson Valley and the land, it became apparent very quickly that the Indians were not going to survive here. Couple that with the fact that within the first hundred years of European um, presence here in the Hudson Valley, native people's population was reduced by 50% mostly through disease like smallpox and measles, even the common cold. How can kids learn more about the natives in the Hudson Valley? The New York State Museum in Albany has wonderful exhibits on the people who lived in the Hudson Valley uh, before the Europeans arrived. Thank you very much for your time and information. You're very welcome, Kim. The natives used the river as a source of food and transportation. They respected the river and tried to never waste its resources. Speaking of transportation, Brad and I learned a lot about transportation on the Hudson River when we visited Karen Nichols at the Hudson River Maritime Museum in Kingston. Hi, we're here at the Hudson River Maritime Museum with the Education Director, Karen Nichols. Karen, what can you tell us about the history of transportation on the Hudson River? One of the earliest forms of transportation on the Hudson that was associated with the Algonquin Indians. It's a birch bark canoe. So the Native Americans used the canoes for traveling across the river and for trade? Both of those things are true, and I believe they also used the canoes to fish, which was one of the means of meeting their needs, obviously. And I think ultimately they were able to use the canoes to transport some of the newly arrived Europeans across the river. So I think they almost served as a sort of a taxi service of sorts in the beginning. And then right below the canoe, which is hanging on the wall, you can see the next form of transportation that really took over here on the Hudson, and it's schooners and sloops. The paddle wheel steamers um, were really the first form of mass transportation in the Hudson Valley uh, starting in the 1830s and up throughout the Civil War people were using the side wheel steamers to move up and down the Hudson Valley. Okay, well here we are standing in front of a model of the most famous Hudson River paddle wheel steamboat of all, the Mary Powell. She was built in 1861. The fare for a ride on the Mary Powell, and let's say that would be from New York to Albany, would be somewhere along the lines of $1.50 to $2. This is one of the more modern paddle wheel steamers. Again, it could carry many more people than the old uh, model, such as the Mary Powell. You could fit somewhere along the line of 4,000, 5,000 people on here. Um, and again, people really loved to ride these boats. They would take excursions up the river on weekends, and it became a mass form of recreation. So people had a great time on these boats. Were there any tragedies on the Hudson River? 
There were several famous disasters, one of which was the tragedy of the General Slocum in 1904, which very few people know about, but it was the worst disaster in New York City before the World Trade Center towers came down. Uh, over a thousand people died. They were primarily women and children, and they had packed themselves onto a boat named the General Slocum. It was an older model, and they were en route to a wonderful day excursion. In a nutshell, the boat caught on fire, and people were unable to escape, so it was a real disaster that wiped out an entire neighborhood. Over here, we have a model of a tugboat. And as you can see, the tugboat looks fairly small, but the size is deceiving. These tugs were very, very large. Often you wouldn't see much of the tug because it was underwater, but they were fairly big boats. And of course, there was a distinction between a river tug on the Hudson River and a harbor tug. Outside in our yard, we have a harbor tug named the Matilda, who did work in New York Harbor for a little while. So we are allowed to have her here at the Hudson River Maritime Museum. But you'll also see an example of a river tug, the Elise Ann Connors. Both of them are 1880s, and both of them um, did the same kind of work, but the Matilda is much larger than the Elise Ann Connors. So tugboats um, were also very much uh, distinct as far as the kinds of things they did, the kinds of boats they moved, and therefore how large they were. Unlike steamboats, ferries move people and cargo across the river instead of up and down, right? Right, that's absolutely correct. The ferries were designed to carry people across the river because really, up to that point, the only option was to try to grab one of those taxis that I spoke of earlier. And I mean, you know, a Native American with a canoe or somebody with a rowboat or a fisherman. And so you had to be able to get across the river more systematically as things be became developed and there was a big population in the Hudson Valley. So all up and down the Hudson River, ferry services popped up ferries were in operation until the early 1960s, so they ran for over 200 years, from the mid-1700s to the mid-1900s, and carried people across the river uh, back and forth, sometimes a 20-minute trip, sometimes a 30-minute trip, but that was a rough uh, sense of, a rough estimate in terms of how long it would take you to get across the river in one direction. Here we are sitting on a ferry waiting room bench that used to be in the Newburgh Ferry House. The Newburgh Beacon Ferry ran from 1743 to 1963, and that's 220 years. The Newburgh Beacon Ferry is currently being restored, and it will soon be in use. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. You're welcome. I thought that the sloops that sailed up and down the Hudson River were really beautiful. Yes, I agree. But as more and more people settled in the Hudson Valley, sloops became less popular because they didn't have a motor and they depended on the wind to move them. I know one industry where time was a critical factor, the fishing industry. The Hudson River's rich commercial fishing industry helped us support the local economy throughout the 1700s and the 1800s. It reached its high point in the mid-1900s when haul scenes, anchor and drift gill nets, and pots and traps were used to catch a variety of seafood. The fishing industry was negatively affected in the 1970s when it was discovered that the river was too polluted to eat any fish. Since then, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, has worked dramatically to make industries responsible for cleaning up their messes. Today, there are about 10 to 12 commercial fishermen on the Hudson River. Fishermen of the 1940s and the 1950s will tell you that other than the technical improvements, traditional methods of commercial fishing used on the Hudson have changed little since the time of the Dutch in the 1600s. There are 30 cancer-causing chemicals in cigarettes. Nicotine is as addictive as heroin. The tobacco industry spends over $8 million each year trying to get us kids to smoke. Children and teens make up 90% of full new smokers. Each year in America, over 420,000 people die as a result of tobacco-related illnesses. Don't be one of these numbers!
Hi, I'm Carlos Perez here with Elizabeth Norris at the ruins of the West Point Foundry. So Elizabeth, what do you do here and what organization are you with? I'm working with Michigan Technological University, which is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And uh, we're, we're in partnership with Scenic Hudson, who owns the West Point Foundry. We're doing archaeology. It's called industrial archaeology because it's about industry. And we've been working here, and we're in our 11th week of, of research this summer. Michigan Tech is using this place to teach people about archaeology as much as they're do, you know, doing research here to learn about the foundry. Every day I find something new, and I'm not...